most women start a business? Is it passion, money, or freedom? Welcome to Female Founders, the podcast that takes you behind the scene with women who are founders and CEOs to help you start and scale a successful business of your own. I am your host, Nagelia de Ravine. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Female Founders. In today's episode, I have the pleasure of speaking with Dennis Hendon. Dennis is an accomplished leader in the nonprofit sector and the co-founder of Managing Coaching. With a career spanning impactful roles in nonprofit, successful consultant experience, and a passion for coaching, Dennis has dedicated herself to empowering nonprofit leaders and transforming organizational cultures. Get ready to be inspired by Dennis' commitment to making an the experience and performance of nonprofit organization leaders more rewarding. Wow, what a pleasure to have you with me, Dennis. Um, I appreciate all the all the work you have been doing. Your story is very interesting and touchy, but also kind of like an inspiration for all of us as women as well. We're not going to have enough time to go over everything you have done, but I hope that the part that we are going to cover is going to help a lot of women out there that need the support, the inspiration, and the motivation behind it to keep on moving forward and with their life. So now, can you share with us the story of how your father's work as a criminal defense attorney influenced you, your career as a lawyer, and how did that initial vision evolve as you discovered the nonprofit sector. Uh, well, thank you so much for um, having me, first of all. I really appreciate being here, and thank you for that question. Um, you know, I was about, um, I, uh, about eight years old, and my dad was a criminal defense attorney in Pittsburgh, and um, when I was eight, it was about the first time that he took me into the courtroom, and I was mesmerized by everything that was going on there and just the whole experience of it. And at the time, he was representing a man who had been charged um, with a homicide by a vehicle called vehicular manslaughter. And um, my dad was researching the case and took me to the family's home in, in Pittsburgh's Hill District. And I felt so uh, welcomed by the family. And I just, watching my dad try to defend this person and make an argument and a case for um, helping them not go to prison, just, just inspired me so much. And I thought that I wanted to be a lawyer, and I held on to that vision for a long time. Um, I thought that helping people was really, really important. Actually, it is. Um, it, it, it is because when we help, one thing that I learned as a, at a young age is um, the more people we help, the, the, the more blessing coming our way. And sometimes we don't get to see it, you know, uh, because we are too busy doing other things, but it's always there. It's absolutely true. I couldn't agree with you more. But now, how did you end up into the nonprofit sector? Well, the short story is that, um, again, during my growing up years, uh, my mom was, uh, she worked in a bank, but she was also a volunteer and she did a lot of, she did a lot of really great things as a volunteer. Um, she started one of the first programs in the city of Pittsburgh for pregnant teens and she helped create one of the first Meals on Wheels programs for homebound seniors. So my mom was a really giving person. Both my parents, um, uh, were when we were growing up and, she introduced me to this whole idea of human services. And I went on a Meals on Wheels route with her one time, um, one winter uh, day, and met a gentleman, so rang the doorbell, met a, an older gentleman named Abraham. When I looked inside his house, it was literally filled from floor to ceiling with newspapers. It was one of the most craziest things that I had ever seen in my young life, and he walked me through this little path into the kitchen and I put the box of food on the table. And I remember getting back into the car and telling my mom, I'm never going to, if I, if I do anything in my life, I'm going to make sure that nobody ever has to live in those kinds of circumstances. And that really opened the door for me to the possibility of having a career in the helping professions. I didn't know exactly what it was going to be. 
But that really opened, you know, my thinking I wanted to be a lawyer and thinking about the helping professions was really the beginning of what led me down the path to the nonprofit sector. But you become a lawyer at the no. end. I ended up, I didn't go to law school. I, when I was in college, I got introduced to urban studies and the uh, idea of a human services career. And much to the, I'll say, disappointment of my dad, I, because I always thought I was going to go to law school, I called my parents one day when I was in college and I said, I've changed my mind. I'm not going to go to law school. Everybody was shocked. And instead, I got an undergraduate degree in urban studies and a master's degree in human services administration, and my doctorate is in public administration. But really, it was my, 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 my mom's exposure to the world of volunteerism that helped me understand that I could develop a professional career in human services. So pretty much you follow your mom footsteps. I did. <laughs> so now your experience delivering meals on wheels at a young age had profound impact on you. Can you describe how that experience shaped your commitment to serving others and working toward reducing social inequalities? Well, you know what it just really that was in the in the mid 1970s and there were a lot of a lot of nonprofit organizations being formed at that time it was you know in the aftermath of the civil rights movement a lot of leaders were creating starting nonprofit organizations creating really interesting ways of helping to thinking about helping people and um I realized that I could have a career in something called nonprofit management. And when I moved to, when I graduated from college and moved to Miami, Florida, the door got open to me um, for an administrate, my first real job out of college as an administrative assistant in a crisis hotline, a 24 hour suicide prevention center uh, and crisis hotline. And that I, there, I learned how to do grant writing. I learned how to do fundraising. I learned about um, leadership. I learned about working on teams. Um, I learned a lot of different skills that are really important to developing a career in the nonprofit sector. And mostly, I would say um, it was because somebody there saw that I was really interested and took an interest in giving me a chance, you know, creating an opportunity. And so that's what led me down the path into the nonprofit sector. Uh, but now, um, when you took your first job in the nonprofit, you initially realized that it wasn't the right fit. But however, you, you did, uh, the, you said, like you said, the administrative assistant opened doors for your career. So now can you dis, um, kind of discuss the role of Shirley Aaron Play in launching your human services career? Uh, yeah, so um, it's one of my favorite stories. She, she was this amazing woman who was really actually, she started as a volunteer and had this idea that, the, that Miami needed a crisis hotline. And she was a great fundraiser and she figured out a way to create this organization it was called Switchboard of Miami. And uh, I was, so, so it was a, a volunteer uh, driven um, uh, program where volunteers would answer the crisis hotline. And there was a bulletin board and I saw a job opening for a communications assistant. And I applied for that job and I, and she, uh, called me in for an interview. And I remember her laughing and saying, I have no idea why you applied for that job. You are not even remotely qualified to be a communications assistant, but I really liked your resume and I have something else in mind for you. And so at the time she said, I'm looking for an assistant um, for myself and I'd really like to offer you that job. So I think the, the thing that I still think a lot about that job was um, 
you know, just taking an opportunity to say, you know what, I'm really interested in something. I'm going to try it. I'm going to put my name in the hat and I'm going to see what happens. And she really did um, open the door for me to she ta- she was a great grant writer and she shared that skill with me. She introduced me to how to work with a board of directors. There were just a lot of things that she was willing to share with me. And if it weren't, you know, I I think she really led the way for me to move forward in my career. More like a, more like a mentor. In a she way. really she she was my supervisor and she was very much a mentor. And I've had many of those in my life, actually. And we need them um, because I feel like without mentors, uh, we, not, we don't learn a lot because we're learning from the mistakes, the things they already done. And then uh, also the success they already accomplished themselves. It's absolutely true. And, you know, I don't think there's anything we can do in this life by ourselves. You know, there's no such thing as making your way without the help of other people. And so um, I think... You know, I've tried to do that a lot in my career, too. Um, As I've, you know, developed my career and my business, I really like to give back and try to do as much mentoring as I can do because it was so important um, in my life. And it's still important. But, now, you know, reading about it, something else also that um, took a very profound impact on you was the passing of Dr. Maxine uh, Thurston. I'm not sure if I'm saying uh, the name correctly. But how did that, how did her leadership and values influence your own approach to leadership, to leadership and working in the nonprofit sector? Yes. So Dr. Maxine Thurston Fisher, um, she got married during the time that um, I knew her. So she went from Dr. Thurston to Thurston Fisher. Um, She was a professor of social work and she was also a nonprofit organization leader. And I think the biggest There were so many influences that she had in my life. But one of the biggest influences that she had was to really help me understand that we don't control anything. Even if we think we control things, we really don't. And I used to, you know, plan meeting agendas and make try to make them perfect and then go to meetings and try to orchestrate the meetings exactly like the agenda said. And it it never quite worked out that way. And what Dr. Thurston gave me the comfort in doing was going with the flow. And really building things with other people's input. You know, instead of making my own assumptions, she really helped me to see that you get much, much further when you ask people for their perspective, when you don't try to control everything about an agenda, um, when you really work in partnership with other people. And it really, it was very transforming for me because up till that point in time, I thought leaders were responsible for directing and controlling, and it couldn't be further from the truth. But it was more than that. Um, say a little more what you mean by it was more? No, no. I, I mean, like, um, as leaders also, we take a lot of, a lot of, over the years for me, I met a lot of leaders. There's the one that just kind of like stick to one thing and then that's it. But you have the leader that's open-minded that uh, want to allow themselves to go out there and adventure and then learn new things and learn also from the followers, from the people who follow them. And they open their heart to listen, to learn. And, and I also met the one that doesn't want to listen. They don't want to learn anything from anyone else. What they know they think is the truth and that's it for them. Yeah, you, yes, absolutely. Thanks for clarifying. Absolutely. L- leadership is really, a, really what I learned from Dr. Thurston Fisher is Leadership is really about being there for the other person, not not being there for yourself, but really um, creating a vision, um, enabling the other person to live that vision with your support and your help. And I've tried to do that as much as I can, both 
after I met her and the work that I was doing with her. And then as I move forward, developing my own business and in my relationship with our clients, I really try to carry that out in everything we do. But why did you take the leap of starting your own business? Well, um, so I have to thank Dr. Thurston Fisher for this again. Um, when I finished my PhD, she said to me, you have to leave Florida now. Um, I had been in Miami for almost 17 years. And she said, you can, all, you can come back to Florida whenever you want, but you have to get a different experience in another place. I did that and I'm insisting that you do that. And so she insisted that I leave. It was a very, it was so hard, sad for both of us, but she was so wise and uh, she helped me choose the, the Washington DC area. And so I found a great professional opportunity in uh, Baltimore and I moved to Baltimore. And while I was in Baltimore, um, I didn't, you know, when I got there, I went there for my job. I didn't know anybody there and I didn't have an easy way of meeting people. So I answered, I took a risk. I took a lot of risks in, in, in my life. Um, uh, I would say professionally, I answered a personal ad in the Baltimore Jewish times. And I met the person who now, who's now my husband, um, but when we first met, he was an entrepreneur and we had been dating for a few months and he was not really familiar with nonprofit organizations and the work that I was doing. And one day he said to me, you know, I've been watching you for the last several months and you work, you, you're working so hard for this one organization. If I could help you start your own business so that you could do what you're doing in this organization, would you be interested? I had never even considered the idea of opening my own business. But the question was impactful. And so together, uh, we became business partners. We are still business partners to this day. Uh, so, and, and we're now married, but we, um, we became business partners. We opened Managence Coaching and we've been doing it together for 23 years. Wow. So beautiful. You don't find that too often. You don't. Um, you know, he, uh, Larry, my business partner and my husband, he has been a really impactful part of my life. He's been my coach for 23 years, even though I went back to school to become a professional coach, he continues to be my coach. Um, you know, as a business, a business person, an entrepreneur with a successful business himself, uh, with a, with a business background that I didn't have, with a perspective in finances that I didn't have, um, I, he's helped our business be successful and helped me be successful because I needed that perspective. But now uh, the company name is, uh, am I saying the name correctly? My name, my, my name? It's Managence. Yes. Managence. But why did you pick that name? Because the whole time I was like, why did she pick that name? Why did she pick Managence? Like, does it have something to do with management? Or Yeah. You're, thanks for the question. I really appreciate it. So Managence is the first half of the word management. And the last half of the word performance. And the name came from Larry's business partner in another business that he's in. His business partner had never heard of the kind of uh, coaching and meeting facilitation and uh, leadership development and board development, the kind of work that we do. He was unfamiliar with it. And so one day we were talking, this was before we opened the company, he asked me to describe for him what we do, and I described it, and he said, just, just without missing a beat, Rick said, you do managements. And I said, what? We do what? He said, you know, management and performance, managements. And that's how our company's name was, that's how we got our company name. I got the first part right, but I didn't get the second part. I was just trying to figure it out. Okay, management, management. 
So I'm thinking the management part, but where did the rest come from? So I look at your husband. I'm like, no, nothing to do with the husband. Your name, nothing to do with your name. I couldn't come up with the second part of it, but this is awesome. <laughs> Well, you know, at the time, um, I had done a little research about naming companies, and it's been a, it's been kind of a, a, a bit of a double-edged sword. It's a hard word to say, managements. Um, it's you know a long word. Um, probably, you know, a marketing consultant today wouldn't recommend using that kind of term, but it always creates a conversation. So the opportunity mm -hmm. comes in the conversation. Even if people have a hard time saying it, we can still always talk about what it means. Oh, I love it. Managements. And that's fancy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so now let's talk a little bit more about the company. You have it for over, you and your husband have it for over 20 years. What is it about? And um, as a coach, what kind of coaching do you guys provide it? Is it for small businesses or corporation? How does it? So what? for the entire time of our business, our, our focus has been on nonprofit organizations and nonprofit leaders. Nonprofit organizations comes, come in all sizes. They're not all volunteer driven. Mm -hmm. Many of them have a very large staff and very large budgets. They are professional organizations, just like other kinds of businesses. And our, our focus is helping them be the best they can be in delivering on their mission. And our clients are their leaders, executive directors, uh, CEOs, senior leadership teams. And we help them with primarily with strategic planning, team development, board development. And our coaching is one-on-one -on -one with leaders and teams and it's all about how do you elevate your performance to elevate the mission of your organization. Wow. Especially the board, uh, it's usually the, one of the hardest. Find the exact uh, match to be on the board. It is, you know, so boards of directors are volunteer entities and they're every state, most it's a it's a, a law that nonprofit organizations are required to have volunteer boards. And so it takes a lot of work to uh, develop a board building cycle that makes sense for your organization to not just have any volunteers, but to find the right leaders that can support the mission that your organization has. So it takes mm -hmm. a lot of intention. Absolutely. But uh, when you when you work with the leaders, do you, is it based, based on coaching, one on one coaching, or is it like a group coaching? How does that work? Well, we do both. Uh, so very often, I'll have um, our individual leaders, often um, executive directors and CEOs, who may be feeling stuck in uh, where they are in their career and they want the opportunity, they want some help getting unstuck. Um, they want to grow their organization and they're not quite sure how to do that. And so we'll sometimes I'll work with them for six months, nine months. I have some clients that I work with for a year. We set goals that they want to achieve. We meet twice a month, sometimes more often and really help them think about what is it they want to achieve and what's getting in the way of achieving that and how can they get past the things that are keeping them stuck and afraid to do the things that they want to do. And we do that same thing with leadership teams, whole teams. Whole team. Do you also do workshops for teams? I do a little bit of conference presenting um, uh, you know, to introduce the kind of work that we do. Um, but I don't do too much training. I do, mo I do more, uh, coaching, which is really leading with a lot of questions and doing a lot of exercises that help leaders think about where they want to go. And then I do some consulting as well. I was just going to say ahead. consulting is a little bit more coming in with recommendations and suggestions of things that they might do. They might do. 
But you say that you work, you can, sometimes you can stay with them longer than a year. What about if they need you longer? Uh, I mean, like they stay with you for one year. What about if they need you longer than one year? Is that something you're willing to do? Or is just like one year is the maximum of time that you will stay with the client? Oh, no, we have we have some clients um, that we've that we've been working with three years. Ten, and we actually have one client that we have almost a 10 year relationship with. And we have a few clients that come back every so often when they need a different kind of support. So we're really flexible. Uh, we co-create every relationship that we have with every client. So we figure out what each client needs and together we figure out the best way uh, to work together. We don't take a prescriptive perspective. In other words, I don't go in and assess the situation and say, this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going uh, to remedy this situation. I really come in together and work with each client and partner with them in figuring out what the best approach is going to be. But now what's said that you're competing apart from other uh, company out there that's doing the same thing? I love that question. Thank you. I think um, a few things that set us apart. One is my years of experience working in the nonprofit sector as a nonprofit leader. I just bring a lot of inside perspective to the work that I do because I've been there. Uh, the second thing is that we take a very neuroscience based approach to uh, our coaching and our consulting. So I've done a lot of um, studying about how neuroscience impacts leadership and organizations. And we bring the neuroscience based tools into the work that we're doing. And then the third thing I would say that just differentiates us is our flexibility and our co-creative partnership with our, with our clients. But also I think that another great thing with it is the, also is the fact that um, a lot of time as women, when we start business, sometimes we, uh, we don't have a support. But with you, it's the opposite of that. You had a support all along with that also to keep you ongoing as well. And a, a different perspective also, I would think, your husband going to the table compared to yours. And I think that's also kind of uh, making the company stronger than usual. Then you find uh, when you find one uh, business owner as a woman uh, fighting for sometimes we take our focus away, especially as women, we have children, we have other things. Sometimes off, we don't see things in the same way. And when you bring somebody else, they will see it in a different way. It's when you put the two together, two different perspectives, you collaborate them together. It's, ma it's like magic. And I think that having that with you and your husband kind of make the company move forward even in a different way compared to others. You know, I really, um, Nigelia, thank you so much for pointing that out. I do think that all of the mentors and all of the people that have influenced my life have really helped me to pass forward that approach, you know, to, and so I really do go into, you know, every conversation, like wanting to know what's important to the person that I'm working with and really wanting to understand their strengths and what they bring to the table and figuring out how I can fit into that as opposed to coming in and saying, I know what you need to, to fix this. And I think that that really comes from just my willingness and openness to partnering and including others and just really cre uh, finding value in doing that. Like, I think that that real value comes from partnership. Absolutely. But, you know, one thing, uh, it's, it's a little bit hard to find good partnership. And I know from the beginning, I said to you, it's, um, it's when you see husband and wife working together, to, especially for such a long time, toward one common goal, it's not something you see very often. And I think that if we have more of that out there, it will be a lot better for our next generation to be able to, to work together as one. Even if it's not your husband, it can be just a friend. And um, it's not something we see a lot, partnerships. Uh, well, it's, way it's down. hard work. It's hard work. It's absolutely hard work. Um, you know, 
uh, we we put a lot of effort. My husband and I put a, and I put a lot of effort uh, into uh, you know working well together. And it's not always smooth sailing, but we're really committed to making it work. And I have partnership relationships with maybe not formal business partnership relationships with many other people, and it. It takes work. It takes trust. It takes a willingness to be flexible, to learn what what is the other person, what's important to the other person, and being accommodating, um, and to let letting go of the feeling like I have to be right and I have to figure this all out by myself all the time. It just really requires a willingness to say, you know what, it's going to be better. If I um, get ideas and perspectives and input from other people. And for me, it always has been better. And that's what I like about you. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, how do you go about cultivating inclusive and leadership styles and transforming organizational cultures? Oh, boy. Um, well, I think the short answer to that question is that I have done a lot of training in these met these neuroscience based methods. One is called energy leadership, one is called conversational intelligence, and one is called positive intelligence. And each one of them brings a different framework for create collaborating, co-creating, and working in partnership. And so your question about how do I um, help leaders think about becoming inclusive leaders, for me, it starts with developing a positive mindset in yourself as a leader. Then it's thinking about how are you willing to partner and collaborate and really learning some tools uh, to create that kind of um, open relationship with other people how to be empathetic, how to be in discovery with other people, how to innovate um, with them, how to, you know, develop new ideas. So that's, that's um, a part of it. Um, another piece of it is, let's see, we talk about inclusive leadership. Another part of it is thinking about how to have good conversations. It doesn't just happen. So you really need to think about how do you foster a trusting and open conversation? And when you make a mistake, how do you recover from it? And really be okay with, you know, saying, I made a mistake. I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to do better next time. So a real willingness to do that. In addition to the conversations is really thinking about your leadership practices, meaning the methodology that you use to bring other people along with you and your willingness to be when, you know, every year there's new things out in the marketplace. So how willing are you to learn about new things, try new things, take risks? So your leadership practices is a big piece of that. And then the final two pieces are really being intentional about your strategy. You know, if you want people to come along with you, helping uh, bringing them into building the strategy together so that you can then think about the actions that you're going to take together. I just really feel strongly that for small businesses, nonprofit organizations, and even larger businesses with many teams, the more we create engagement and bring people into conversations to be included, the better the organization is going to do overall, no matter the size. Absolutely. So now how can people reach out to your company for support, for guidance? And, um, and how does that, uh, the first step, what was the first step toward that? Well, a great way to connect with me is on LinkedIn. Denise Rothman Hinden is my um, profile on LinkedIn. You can also connect with us at managens.com, our website. Um, and in either place, there is um, you know, contact information. You can email me at info at managens.com. 
Um, you can also call me. Uh, I'm happy to leave a cell phone number if that's appropriate. But all that information is at, at as on our LinkedIn profile too. But um, do you have any advice for um, leaders in the nonprofit sector? How, um, especially after COVID hit, a lot of leaders suffer a lot. Um, bringing an employee back to the office. A lot of things changes, you know, because employees wasn't there, now they're coming back, board, they lost the boards. A lot of things happen. Do you have any advice for them to keep on moving forward? I would say two things, three things. One is, you know, look at your own behavior as a leader and think about, you know, what you're doing well and what might be getting, what where you might be getting stuck. And um, thinking about the help that might, the support that you might need to help you get unstuck. Uh, the second would be to think about where are there opportunities in the challenges that you are facing. I truly believe that every situation we find ourselves in uh, in the workplace, there is always a better way to. There is always another way or a better way. And to give yourself some time to think through that. And the third thing is to take it one step at a time. One that, step at a time. You know, one step at a time. If you keep every day taking steps forward, you will get where you want to go. I love that. Take it one step at a time because sometimes we try to, to do many steps at a time. Yes. <laughs> and we get lost very fast too with that. Yes, absolutely. So the, the, more, the more you take care of yourself, the more empathy that you give to yourself in taking it one step at a time, the more energy you'll actually have um, to tackle the big things. I agree. Anything else you'd like to, any, anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? Anything you, you'd like to say to them? Uh, thank you. I think I'd like to just finish with, it's really important to take care of ourselves as uh, women leaders. Uh, it's really important to, yeah, take care of yourself every day. I, I use mindfulness practices um, every day through um, the framework of positive intelligence. I do breathing exercises. I do other sensory exercises. Two minutes, a few times a day, even if you don't think that you have time for it, you do have time for it and it really can make a difference in your life. So that would be one. If you take care of yourself first, like putting the oxygen mask on yourself first, um, you know, when the flight attendants tell you to do that in an airplane, if you take care of yourself, you have more to give others. So that would be what, I, you know, the thing... Maybe I'll just leave it at that, um, that that's the most important thing. Find the time. If you tell yourself you don't have the time, you're just hurting yourself. Find the time, little bits of time to take care of yourself and your business and your organization will go further. And I don't have anything to add to it. You couldn't say it more beautifully, right? Thank you. Thank you so much for giving me the chance to talk to you, to understand what you do and also to learn a little bit more from all these experience, experiences you have over the years. And I think that um, we, have a, we have a lot to learn in this world, but if we keep on learning from one another, we have a better chance of uh, creating a better path for our next generation. And thank you so much for all you do. Well, thank you. And thanks for this opportunity. It was such a joy talking to you today. Thank you for listening to Female Founders Podcast. That's it for this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on your favorite podcast app or connect with us on warmel.com so that you don't miss our next episode. See you next time. Bye for now.